welcome to the Ophthalmology Business Podcast. We help you develop your ideal practice with help of other doctors and experts. The topics we cover include marketing, management, leadership, recruitment, HR, mindset, and more. I'm Dr. David Lazar, one of the co-hosts of this podcast. Every listener of the podcast is welcome to join the Ophthalmology Business Academy at www.obacademy.org. Membership is on us, and it's our gift to you. Today, I'm excited to talk with Carrie Asil, MD, ophthalmologist and medical director at the Asil Gaur Eye Institute. With an exceptional reputation and years of experience, Dr. Asil has earned the distinction of being the go-to surgeon for cataract and LASIK procedures in Los Angeles. Today, we'll be discussing the topic of private practice development and introduction to investing for a medical doctor. Let's jump in. Harry, thank you so much for being here. I, you are the perfect person to be on this podcast. Uh, we could talk for many different episodes, but today I'd like to just focus on your history uh, and track record as a serial entrepreneur. You've developed your own successful private practice in Los Angeles. Not easy to do. You've also developed a uh, adjacent uh, ambulatory surgical center, which is uh, very popular in Los Angeles. And also you're a serial entrepreneur in your own private investing. So I'd like to just take each one of those uh, step by step and see if we can tease out some pearls. Certainly, thank you. That's a nice topic that you selected out of the bag. Um, it'll be fun. Uh, would you like me to jump in or did you have specific? Yeah, I, why don't we start with your private practice and and where are you kind of, when you when you started the practice, when you became involved, where was it? How did you assess where you wanted to be and how did you get it to grow to the point where it is now? And really focusing on any kind of pivotal points in the growth of that practice that that uh, our listeners might uh, learn a lesson from. Sure. I remember reading a book when I was much younger and uh, I think it was called uh, The Richest Man in Babylon or something like that. And it wasn't about becoming wealthy but about building success. Uh, it was, uh, the story supposedly took place, you know, 6,000 years ago and it was a dialogue and so forth. But I remember it said that luck knocks on everybody's door. It's a lucky man that answers the call. Um, in other words, it's a wise person knows to answer the call and therefore they could be referred to as lucky. Um, and a second, a second um, principle I think to take in mind is to understand that the earth is likely just a school for souls. We've all come here to learn things. And so when things happen, rather than thinking about them happening to us and, oh, wow, you know, why me and woe me and, and so on and so forth. Um, which can be a tough mindset to break for physicians. I'll explain in a moment. It's if you think of it as a school for souls, then it, then things are happening for you, and so that there is an opportunity in everything. And with that in mind, if we think of those two principles right there, that luck answers on every door. It's a wise man that opens the door. So there's opportunities are abound. You just have to recognize when you want to make yourself open to it. And then as things happen along the way, to view those also as opportunities, the hiccups along the way are not barriers meant to bury you. They're meant to be places that can serve as a scaffold for you to propel off of. So along those lines, you know, like most doctors, I knew I was going to be a doctor from a young age and from the time I was two years old, I told everybody I was going to be a doctor. They thought it was really cute. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, with that in mind, I went to UCLA. I got my straight A's. I was a good student and all that. Uh, went off to medical school at UC San Diego. And when I arrived, I became very disenchanted. I, I found the rote memorization to be far different than the beautiful science that I had studied as an undergrad. And so I actually considered quitting medical school. And um, I went to the Dean of Students, told them I was gonna drop out. A classmate and I were gonna go backpacking through the Amazon together. Uh, this was the beginning of the second year 
of uh, medical school. He he got talked out of it by one of our other classmates the night before we were going to leave. So I was stuck in medical school, not knowing what to do, kind of despondent, you know, riding my motorcycle everywhere, uh, living off of lecture notes, etc. And then I discovered that I could go skiing and defer uh, a rotation in neurology, which was a topic I didn't care for. Uh, if I pretended I wanted to do an ophthalmology rotation. And so I did the ophthalmology rotation and uh, um, fell in love. Never looked back, you know, kind of became a top model student all of a sudden and uh, doing research in the Department of Ophthalmology uh, and uh, headed off into ophthalmology. And then I had um, come across some unexpected information, uh, stumbled across it accidentally concerning one of the deans of the school. And he discovered that I knew this and without knowing it, I had been blacklisted and, uh, um, and to my amazement, didn't get into an ophthalmology, uh, residency when I, when the match came out and, and, you know, it was one of those moments, uh, where you wonder, why this is happening to you. Um, I was too young to have adopted the principle that it's happening for me, but it was based on events such as this that I came to realize that latter principle. Um, young professor uh, Robert Weinreb um, uh, trusted in me and said, you know, uh, hang out and uh, work in my lab. He said, you know, what do you want to do? You're going to go into another specialty. I said, no, I really love this. He said, hang out, I'll, I'll work with you. And while I was in the lab, they ended up, <laughs> it was a young department. I ended up having my own lab eventually uh, over just the course of a short while. And I developed new technologies that had to do with sustained drug delivery called multivesicular liposomes. And the rest was history, as they said. I uh, became kind of a celebrated applicant, uh, nothing that the dean could do at that point to stop anything. And uh, the department asked if I would, please, you know, stay on with them. And with the idea that I would do my residency there and I would um, then, you know, go do a fellowship somewhere and come back and join the faculty. And during my residency, I continued some of my research. Residency went great. Uh, went off to do my internship uh, uh, or rather went off to do my uh, um, fellowship. And in my fellowship, I uh, discovered that I could be more successful if I stayed in St. Louis rather than going back to Los Angeles. And uh, uh, so I joined the faculty there and I invented some new techniques in refractive surgery and surgeons were flying in from all over the world to learn from me. I had thousands of doctors going through courses. And uh, however, a political uh, battle broke out in the department where my chairman who I was acting as vice chairman already at, at a very young age. I was all of 32 years old at the time. My chairman got into a, a bit of a hot water with the uh, university because our retina department, actually your specialty, <laughs> revolted against him. And uh, um, the president of the uh, medical center uh, came to my apartment one night and we were drinking vodka together. And he said, I want you to be the chairman. And I realized that that would mean my taking down, helping him take down my chairman. And I decided I had to get the hell out of there. Um, I was uh, then at Duke University giving a lecture for an alumni day. I was, the, I was the visiting guest professor. And at the dinner that night, um, Mark Terry from Oregon was there and he said, and we were both quite young at the time. He says, Carrie, what do you, you know, I hear you looking to leave St. Louis. What do you want to do next? And I had just been offered um, by uh, the chairman at UC Irvine to become, uh, to take his position, which would have made me the youngest chair in the University of California in any department. And it was a great honor um, but it wasn't sticking well with me. I, I had come to realize without fully realizing that I had gotten very early in my career tired of the politics in academia. I, that, that's, if I could just jump in, that's exactly what I was thinking when I'm, when I'm listening to this. It seems like, you know, 
everywhere you went, politics was really a kind of a, a pivotal part of, of the academic life. Is that, do you think that's just unique to the institutions that you were at, or do you think that's just kind of ubiquitous? I think it's life. I mean, we look at the politics on a, on a global basis right now and the, the crazy politics going on in our own country. I think it's everywhere. I think you, you just decide where you fit in and how you navigate it. Um, and I decided that I wanted to opt out of that arena. You know, I'm, I'm known for kind of speaking my mind and in a large collective uh, setting, uh, like a successful department, um, that's, that's always going to create headaches, even though I wasn't at the core of these, um, ladder headaches myself, I was on the periphery and people are asking me to jump in and kind of be the savior. I probably realized that it wouldn't be too long before, um, I, I would be kind of, uh, you know, my turn would come. And and the idea of herding cats just didn't appeal to me anymore. So when Mark Terry asked this, um, you know, I heard myself saying to him, gee, Mark, um, what I'd really like to do is to go back to Los Angeles and build a private eye institute. And the next thing I knew, an attractive lady sitting next to me literally grabbed me by the shirt collar and started dragging me across the room, yelling, Bob, Bob, you got to talk to this young man. It was um, it was Dr. Robert Sinsky's uh, wonderful wife, and Dr. Sinsky had been a Duke alum, and she was calling out to Bob so that uh, the two of us could talk. He was, um, I think, 70 years old at the time, and uh, uh, she wanted him to retire. And so she thought they had been at my lectures, <laughs> and she decided I would be the heir apparent. Um, Bob, for those who don't know, was one of the great leaders of cataract surgeries, the three, one of the three fathers of phaco emulsification, and uh, so successful in his own time that the Robertsonski Vineyard in Napa is his, was his, his son runs it, Bob has passed away. And so here it was, front and center, by putting my wish out into the universe um, and kind of scratching my head over the what was going on luck had knocked on my door and I opened that door uh, Bob and I negotiated for quite a while because I wanted to come and build a private eye institute and he insisted that he would be the benefactor for it but I kind of wanted to make sure things were in place um, and so it took us a while and by 1995 I uh left the university in St. Louis and uh, moved out to Los Angeles, um, only to discover upon arrival that Bob really didn't want to be the benefactor for a private eye institute. He, as he finally shared with me, just wanted to have a place to hang his hat so he could retire with grace. And uh, we understood each other. There wasn't, you know, there wasn't bitter feelings. I was of course very uh, surprised in the beginning and uh but he stayed for another five years. He, he continued to see patients. He, by the time I arrived, he was 72 and he retired at 77 and, uh, and got to retire with Grace. Uh, part of our deal was that I would have first right of refusal to buy into the building, but along, among other things, his um, attorney had convinced him not to do that. So it was also not in the package once I finally arrived. And uh, um I learned lessons from that, which is sign your contracts before you move. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, and so it was that his decision not to serve as a benefactor for the I Institute served as a great um, scaffold for me to spring off of, because at that time LASIK was becoming available. And my field was refractive surgery. I had been a corneal transplant surgeon in St. Louis with a massive practice, but I was also the guy teaching refractive surgery. And I had written the first white paper on how centers could own refractive surgery businesses back in the day of RK. An industry group had come to me. They had taken that white paper that I had written, which they had asked me to write, and they had peddled it around the the world and launched a number of the um, LASIK groups around 
uh, the world, uh, including out of Canada. And that'll be an interesting story that we'll get to. So here I was in Los Angeles without the, the means, without the money to even buy an eczema laser for myself. And now Robert Sinsky, my deep pocket partner, has decided he doesn't want to be the benefactor for an eye institute. And he doesn't want to pony up for an eczema laser. And now I'm running the risk of being left out of the game in the very, very, very thing that I'm known for. Very uh, interesting at the time. So I... I thought, well, I wrote this white paper. Um, it's a business plan. So I went out and I raised money and I not only purchased an eczema laser, but I launched an entire um, LASIK uh, centers group, 40 locations eventually in uh, Boston, you know, Utah, California, all over the country, also in Mexico, Japan, Canada, the top surgeons in each of those regions were within our network, everybody from the president of the American Society of Refractive uh, Surgery to the Mexican Society to the Japanese Society to Howard Gimbel in Canada. And so, uh, and we were the first center group in the world to actually become profitable. Um, and so it looked like Bob Sinsky's decision to not serve as a benefactor and the door being closed in my face for launching a uh, private eye institute, which instead morphed into something else. And that door had been closed in my face, not just by Bob Sinsky. When I arrived, naively um, thinking of myself as the darling of the industry, because so many doctors had come to my courses and I had taught so many people to do refractive surgery, I sent out a letter to all the ophthalmologists in Los Angeles area saying that, you know, I'm, I'm coming to Los Angeles and, uh, and I'd like to launch a private eye institute that can work in tandem with, with all the great doctors in LA and so forth, thinking that they're going to come rushing in and wanting to collaborate. And it was met mostly with silence with the exception of three or four uh, letters that I got back. Back then, you know, we didn't do business uh, we did business with hard paper, not with uh, laptops and uh, I got three or four letters back and they were all hate mail. So, <laughs> <laughs> so do, you still, do you still have those letters? No, I actually, I don't. I, even at the moment, I didn't think of keeping them. Okay. But uh, I, uh, I, you know, I came to, so, so the universe had spoken, you know, the universe had said, no, thou shalt not um, launch a private eye institute in Los Angeles, at least not at this point in time. Now, thou shalt uh, seek other opportunities. So the other opportunity was the LASIK Centers uh, business. And we were called, uh, we started out calling ourselves Vision Correction Centers, and then we became Aris Vision. And uh, um, some of the, you know, gray-haired folks in ophthalmology still remember that era really well. And they remember all the fun I was having gallivanting around the world. I would fly into Japan and do LASIK and teach LASIK courses and recruit surgeons for our Japanese uh, um, subsidiary, which at that time uh, was doing almost 50% of all the LASIK in Japan. Uh, wow. And then I would get on an airplane, fly back to Los Angeles, land at LAX and come straight to the operating room um, over here. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful, exciting. And then the universe spoke again. And what happened next was... Uh, First, there was the dot-com crash. Um, and around that same time, those same Canadian centers that had raised all that money uh, rushed forward and brought out LASIK at $500 an eye. And they opened up a massive center right next to mine in LA. They, I had spoken out against their concept. So they made sure to open a center close to all my locations. <laughs> wow. And they were offering LASIK at $500 an eye. They had a 30,000 square foot LASIK facility just a few blocks away from my location in Santa Monica. And in the process, they and they had raised sufficient money. Their model was to drive all the competition bankrupt and then own LASIK delivery, basically. And uh, um, they succeeded in compressing our numbers we couldn't afford to do lasik at those prices it was costing everybody you know more than well over 
$1,500 an eye to deliver the care. And when it's being offered to the consumer for $300 an eye, it's like selling a Mercedes for $10. Um, and so uh, in order to drive Tesla out of business. Uh, so we ran into difficulties and then the dot-coms crashed and that created bigger problems. And then we were trying to dig our way out of that. And then 911 happened and on the at the moment of 911, more than 90% of all the LASIK in the world canceled overnight. And uh, that created a tailspin that couldn't be regained. In that process, I, of course, stressful times for me, I had to negotiate with all the banks not to foreclose. And even, even a particular industry partner decided to, to act funny and, and, uh, so I was spending my time uh, seeing patients and doing surgery and then walking out in the, into the parking lot and talking about a bank, you know, talking on the phone with some president of some bank about taking 20 cents on the dollar um, and then talking to all the surgeons about buying back their practices from the company. We managed to eventually wind it down without a bankruptcy. And I kind of was now back to... Uh, being my own guy again at the Eye Institute, but this time at least I had an expert laser. Um, and I kind of thought, you know, this was a big journey and and lots of sleepless hours and working, you know, 20 hours a day without too much to, uh, without what it would appear at the time, too much to show for it. But what it had done without my realizing was it had already spawned an entire new chapter in my life. Uh, first off, I was still doing a lot of the uh, lecturing and consulting for industry. And I was on the you know advisory boards for uh, Allergan and Alcon back then. Uh, it was Allergan and Alcon and BNL. And I was helping Allergan and Alcon in various ways. And, and then uh, it became AMO uh, when Allergan spun them out. And, I started working on all kinds of projects with them and designing new techniques for revolutionary uh, LASIK flaps and and uh, um, enjoying kind of, as a result of my interactions with industry, being kind of the first surgeon in the world to do this, that, and the other thing. And so uh, I was going along with that and kind of rebuilding my own uh, practice uh, or building it bigger, I should say, at the Eye Institute. Um, although it was, while it was called an eye institute because I was doing some research and teaching and we had a few doctors, um, it was never that eye institute, private eye institute that I had envisioned. But what happened next is people from other industries started to approach me, asking me to uh, look in on their uh, companies. And I think uh, if time permits, we'll get into that. But um, what it helped me to understand at the time was that there is a, uh, a bigger world out there and it needs to be um, explored. Initially, a friend came to me uh, who had taken on 30,000 acres of land in northern coastal Peru. It was pure desert. And uh, he said, you know, I'd like you to help me because I'm going to grow ethanol. Uh, I'm going to grow sugarcane here and convert it to ethanol. I knew nothing about that industry. And I said, no, thank you. I introduced him instead to another friend who, once he went out there and visited, came back and convinced me that I had to participate. Now, instead of going down and sharing with you the next sequence of all the companies that ended up uh, springing up as a result of that moment, um, I think it's worthwhile for the sake of our listeners, uh, your listeners, to um, kind of think about why it is that doctors are, it is said that doctors don't make good businessmen. And I think it's for a, a variety of reasons. One of them is that because of our process going through medical school, we kind of apply ourselves for all those years and then either bury ourselves in our practices and therefore uh, don't have the time to properly evaluate business ventures 
but also we go through all those years of study and work and then we become a doctor and we start to have an income and we kind of start to look at everything from a cause and effect perspective. Um, you uh, And then our own practices kind of further fortify that. You know, you hand out antibiotics for an infection, it takes care of the infection. You cut out a cataract and remove it and put a lens in the person sees. We see everything as cause and effect. And the business world, it doesn't go, it's not um, one plus one equals two. In the business world, you have to first start out and figure out how you're gonna build a medical school rather than how you're gonna get the education to be a doctor. Um, in the business world, you have to first stop and say, hey, this product that I'm looking at, is there a true need for this in society? What is that need? What is the size of that need? What are the barriers involved? What are the risks? What does the competition look like? And then most important of all, by far, is who is the team that I'm betting on? Who is this guy that wants to take my money? And if you go through that process, you're going to find that you don't fail very often. And suddenly you go from being a doctor and therefore a bad businessman to being a doctor and therefore a great businessman. Because you have some cash flow from your own business. It's just a matter of how to apply it. It's not about running out and buying Bitcoin because everybody's buying Bitcoin and the price is going up so fast that if you don't buy it today, you're going to be left out of the game. It's about, am I going to invest in a cryptocurrency company? And what is the meaning of cryptocurrency? And, and which company am I going to pick? And what does the landscape look like? And who's this guy that's running this particular cryptocurrency company? And do I trust this guy? Why do I, what is it about him that's unique and different? And what do I like about him? Perry, let me jump in here because you, you touched on something. And it's, it's, you were talking about how once you have a, a practice going, you have some cash flow. Uh, that you could, you know, kind of uh, deploy to other areas. How do you, how do you assess how much you're willing to invest in in company in a in a company or a product in an investment? Let's just say, how do you, how do you come up with that number? Do you have like an algorithm, or is it uh, you see that you have X amount in the bank and you're you just kind of feel it out? So now we go back to that first book I told you about, the richest man in Babylon. Yeah. So the idea in building wealth is to first make sure that every year you put 10%. Now I haven't necessarily followed this formula. It just kind of stuck with me back in the day. Um, but I think, you know, some, some algorithm off of this kind of a concept. So the idea for the richest man in Babylon was you first make sure that every year you put 10% of your income into savings. You set aside 10% of your money. You don't spend it. Whether you're making ten dollars a year, you have to put a dollar away, or you're making, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year, you're gonna put ten thousand dollars of it away. The second thing you do is you buy your own house, you own your own home. This is six thousand year old advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, Were you talking about West LA real estate at that time, or that that was just general? Well, I think Babylon was a happening place back then. <laughs> Um, I'm pretty sure it was. Uh -huh. um, and then the third thing is that you take a portion of that um, money that you saved up and a, a large portion of it, and you use it for passive income so that you can replicate yourself, basically. And so you kind of go down that kind of an approach is, is what I would advise to folks and then, and then, yeah, it is a matter of your appetite for any given investment. Now, the other thing that I've done with my particular investments, and it's a whole um, portfolio of companies now that I actually served as co-founder in, and I sit on the boards of and all that fun, fancy stuff, um, is that I made sure that I was able to put up, put up enough time when I had that key guy that I was willing to bet on that was starting a company, I made sure I had enough time to participate in the building of it with him so that I was actively involved in the process. Now, that may be a blessing in the case of some people and a curse in the case of others. What do I mean? 
I've had doctor friends who are a disaster at that, and they are they may even be the inventor themselves, and they're the, the impediment. Right. Why, did that, why did that not happen to me? Because of the school of hard knocks I had already been to. When you build what was a billion dollar company at one time in Aris Vision and watch the whole thing go down, and you have to be the person who unwinds it, you learn a lot of lessons about um, proper risk and uh, risk mitigation. And, uh, you know, the number of lessons is basically too long to try and cover, but I had grown through these previous experiences to be in a position to be able to be a good ally, to be a good um, uh, resource. And uh, case in point, for example, one of the companies early on in ophthalmology, when I was still in diapers, that I consulted for was called um, OrbTech. It was the, their product was the orb scan. It was the first real topography system that not only gave us surface topography of the front of the cornea, but it showed us the size of the pupil, the white to white diameter of the cornea, the uh, elevation of the front of the cornea, the elevation of the back, therefore full thickness pachymetry, the whole nine yards. The guy who was the young CEO at the time was a guy named Jack Savage. Jack came to me, I was still a young professor in St. Louis at the time, and he said, Carrie, I want you to invest in the company. I was their medical director and I was helping him develop the product. And with my hands uh, shaking, I wrote him a check for $50,000 at the time because I was following one of the key principles that I shared, not knowing that that's what I was doing. I totally trusted Jack. I thought he was just a great guy. And it was the only $50,000 I had to my name. I wrote him a check. Six months later, he came back and gave me a check for $250,000, oh. which in today's dollars would be like, you know, two and a half million dollars. And uh, um, he said, thank you very much. I just sold the company to BNL and you've been amazing. And, and we shook hands and hugged and, and then Jack left the industry and I went on and this was, this would have been like 1994 or something like that. 1995, I think a uh, long time ago. And I, and we lost touch. And then um, two, three, four years ago, I was in Mexico doing next generation cataract surgery. And after the surgeries, you know, you, you're tired and you, you go back to your hotel room and I'm sitting there and everything's anticlimactic. And uh, there's no, you know, five piece band playing for me after I walked out of last surgery. And I'm looking at a window in Monterey, contemplating my flight home. And I noticed that there's a call on my phone that I've missed. And it's from Jack Savage. And I haven't talked to Jack in God, you know, 25 plus years. What, what's Jack want? And so I, and is it really Jack Savage? Could it be that his phone number's changed? And this is just another number assigned to, Somebody else, I, I don't know. So I called the number and it was Jack and we started talking and talking about old times. And uh, and and after a while, he's like, uh, there's a pause and uh, on his end. I said, so Jack, what were you calling about? And he pauses. He says, I'm so sorry, Carrie. You must have been a pocket dial. It was oh an accident at all. And I said, oh, uh, okay, Jack. Well, I just, I was about to hang up the phone. I said, but you know, Jack, I want to thank you for something. Way back when you had me invest that $50,000, you kind of spawned in me a, a insight and understanding that led me to um, later invest in so many companies and so many startups. And I've launched so many companies now. And I just want to thank you for that. And he said, Carrie, it may not be, have been a pocket dial after that. After all, it might have been a karmic call because I have a startup right now that I'd like to tell you about. And I said, sure. And it was about non-laser tattoo removal, a company called Tattoo Away. And sure enough, I become a co-founder with him, blah, blah, blah. Fast forward, we now have you know five locations and, and uh, have a much better solution for removing tattoos than lasers do, et cetera. And so, you know, this 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 hand that knocks on the door will knock in funny ways. So and what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing from you is that you bet on people just as much as you bet on the product or company. They're, they're equal in your mind. It has to be all of the above um, eventually, I, but the, the, it's not equal in my mind. It's the people are by far the most important. Got if, it. if you have the right people and the product fails, they'll figure out a way to make it successful or they'll pivot 
to make something else successful. If you have the wrong people, you can hand them gold and it'll drop out of their hands into a, you know, into an ocean and sink to the bottom. Um, it's, it's definitely um, the people first and foremost, but then you assess the industry. It happens that I know a lot about lasers and their effect on the human body because of all the lasers we have in ophthalmology. It also happens that when I was a medical student in San Diego, I was also doing research in uh, wound healing was the research I was doing with those multivesicular liposomes. And that research I was doing in collaboration with the plastic surgery department also because they were interested in wound healing as well. And I actually had characterized the first myofibroblasts, the keratocytes and uh, fibroblasts of the eye become myofibroblasts when you injure them, uh, injure the tissue. And so I knew what things work in the body with lasers and what doesn't. And I knew that lasers could never really remove a tattoo from the body. And I knew based on his approach that it could work. I knew it was a massive industry. I knew there was a societal need because you had an unmet need in such a large industry of doing tattoos, when people want to remove them, they really don't have an option other than slapping on a bigger tattoo on top of the old one. However, I would have never considered even, even entertained the idea if uh, I didn't first uh, get to know the inventor and the CEO entrepreneur and believe in him. In this case, he had a 30 year track record with me. So that part of the, my due diligence had already been done for me. So on that phone call, when he told you about the, uh, the laser tattoo removal, were, did you just, were you like show, you know, sign on the dotted line or did you ask for more information and kind of look at numbers and, and learn about the industry? I had him send me the deck and uh, um, I had him get me up to speed on the industry and I then queried a few folks and confirmed that uh, the lasers truly don't work. I had heard they don't work, but I needed to know better. So I talked to some dermatologists and others who had had experience with the lasers and they confirmed that they don't work. And then I, you know, at that point, I started to look at his uh, patents that he had already gotten. And uh, he really didn't have a team. He thought he had a team, but he didn't. And I realized that would be one of the areas I would be able to help him with. He really didn't know how to market it properly. And I, again, knew that would be an area. So there was, so a lot of the raw ingredients were there, but there was also the opportunity for my earning my involvement and, um, and having, you know, capital to help him enabled me to help him get us out of the gate. Um, and so, uh, no, I still did my due diligence. Um, you always do but it was a much shorter due diligence than I would have otherwise had to do. And that has not been a uncommon theme in my companies um, is uh, first, you know, meeting the founder and or already knowing the person in the case of that uh, first company, I told you about the raw land desert in Peru. We pivoted so many times along the way, um, with our hats in our hands and collecting money from friends and family and other things as we went. Um, and we never produced a single drop of ethanol. Um, instead, um, and that's that could be a whole podcast by itself, but instead today, we're the world's second largest producer of uh, premium blueberries on the entire planet. I actually think that's a perfect place to end this podcast but I think on, a, on another episode, I'd like to. Uh, I we've talked we've talked about that that story before, and I think there's a ton of lessons um, to be teased out there. But uh, for today's talk, I think I think this is a, a perfect place to to kind of end. If there's if there's one piece of advice um, you would give a, a medical doctor who's an ophthalmologist or any type of medical doctor who thinks that they have an appetite for starting a business or investing in a business. What what would what would uh, one piece of advice be? I would say first and foremost, invest in yourself. Yeah, um, invest in yourself. You are the you are the product. You know, you are the shoe in the shoe store. You are the Tesla and the dealership. 
you are the product. So invest in yourself, make yourself the best doctor you can be, stand by every patient, look to get the best results. And I had to do that when I moved to Los Angeles. I was, even though I had been, I was known all over the world at a young age, I was a nobody in the eyes of the patients in Los Angeles when I arrived. And there were very prominent doctors here already doing what I hope to do. So invest in yourself and that will be the key. Every time that the chips are down, invest in yourself, believe in yourself and, and make yourself the best you can be. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Carrius Sill, for joining us today and talking to us about private practice development and introduction to investing for a medical doctor. I also want to take a moment to thank our listeners. We appreciate each and every one of you. We cannot do what we do without you. If you like our podcast, simply share it with your friends and on social media. Also, please don't forget to write a review on iTunes or Google Play. Your reviews will help other doctors and practice owners find us. Till we meet again, wishing all of you an amazing week ahead.